Okay, so I think we can more or less begin. It's nine o'clock, right? It's perfect now. So we're very pleased to have Antonella Palmese, and she's going to tell us about gravitational wave cosmology with galaxy surveys. So take it away. Hi, yes, thank you. It's great to give this talk. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, so yes, today I'm going to talk about cosmology with gravitational waves and galaxy surveys, and mostly I'll be focusing on uh, recent results from the Dark Energy Survey, and I will also say something about future prospects with the Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument. And I will refer to these two experiments as DES and DESI, in case you're not familiar with those. Um, so in this talk, I will start by talking about gravitational wave standard science. I will tell you a few words about DES and DESI. Um, and then I will tell you about what are the current measurements with gravitational waves under sirens and what are the prospects for the future. Uh, then I will move on to say something about how we can measure the peculiar velocity field with gravitational waves. And then in the last part of the talk, I will move on to something that is less related to cosmology, but still interesting uh, for galaxy surveys, which is trying to understand the origin of binaries that emit gravitational waves by looking at their host galaxies. Uh, throughout this talk you'll see a few acronyms, in particular NS for neutral star, BH black hole, BNS binary neutral star, BBH binary black hole, and an SBH is a neutral star black hole. Um, okay, so let me start by telling you what uh, the Dark Energy Survey is. Um, so this was a, a five, well it ended up being a six-year survey uh, that ended actually last year in 2019. We observed about 300 million galaxies over 5,000 square degrees that cover this tank-shaped footprint in the southern hemisphere. Uh, we used a dark energy camera to, to do this survey uh, and one interesting thing about the dark energy camera is that it's still one of the best instruments for gravitational wave follow-up at least in the southern hemisphere. Uh, the reason for that is that it has a quite large field of view uh, but it also, it also allows us to go quite deep, quite quickly. Um, and this camera is currently mounted on the CTIO Blanco 4 meter telescope in Chile. So the programs that we have had for DES are mostly well, the, the wide field survey that you see here. Uh, then we also had a supernova survey that covered 30 square degrees that were observed more or less every week to, to search for supernovae that were used for cosmology. Um, we also had a neutrino follow-up of high energy neutrino ice cube events. Uh, and then of course the gravitational wave follow-up of LIGO Virgo events since the uh, very early uh, LIGO Virgo events. Um, one thing I want to mention is that the, a lot of the DES data is actually public at the moment. Uh, and so if you go to this link, you'll find uh, 400 million objects that come from the year three observations. And so in this talk, you'll hear me talking about year three observations. So these are basically observations that were done during the first three, year, three years of operation. So they're not the full survey, they're not to full depth, but they still cover the whole DES footprint. Um, okay, so now motivation for gravitational wave cosmology. At the moment, we're really looking at very nearby events, so which means that we are mostly probing the Hubble constant only. In the future, we'll be able to probe other cosmological parameters, but at the moment, we're really constraining just the Hubble constant. Um, as many of you for sure already know, uh, one good reason for doing that is that there is uh, a 4.4 sigma discrepancy between early and late time universe measurements of uh, the Hubble constant. And so this is what is shown here in this famous plot from uh, the Riz et al. paper from last year showing the discrepancy between measurements that come from or that are related in some way to the CMB and the, uh, the late time measurements that come from uh, late time universe such as supernovae and others. Um, so now the reason for this discrepancy could either be systematics or, or, or perhaps uh, more uh, interestingly new physics. Uh, but one way to try and figure out uh, whether it's one or the other is to have another independent measurement of the Hubble constant. And if this is coming from the late universe, ideally we want something that is independent of the distance ladder on which the current supernovae type 1a measurements are based. So uh, standard siren is a, standard sirens are a great way of doing that. Uh, let me remind you how standard sirens work. So they're pretty similar to, to the way we use standard candles, but in this case, the distance, the luminosity distance comes directly 
can be measured directly from the gravitational wave signal. Um, on the other hand, if you're able to identify the counterpart to a gravitational wave event and, and hopefully also a host galaxy, you could measure the redshift of the host galaxy so you can relate these two quantities and populate the Hubble diagram when you have several events and finally fit the distance redshift relation, which is sensitive to first order to, to the Hubble constant, especially for the very nearby events that we are uh, interested in here. So uh, in this talk, I will talk about two different ways of doing uh, standard star measurements. Uh, and both of these rely, rely on the presence of uh, host galaxies. Um, but there are other methods that I'm just not going to discuss here that, for example, just use the gravitational wave data to make measurements of the Hubble constant. And in that case, the redshift will come uh, from, some other, from another way. Uh, for example, by making an assumption about the mass function of, of the events. Uh, but I'm not going to discuss them here. Uh, here, we're really interested in the multi-messenger measurements of the Hubble constant. So uh, there's mostly two ways of doing that. One way is probably the most straightforward one when you have an electromagnetic counterpart, and this is expected for binary stars and, and also some interstellar black holes. Uh, in this case, the measurement is quite straightforward, and uh, you just have one unique host galaxy, and we talk about the bright standard siren case. Um, but you can also attempt to make a measurement when you don't have an electromagnetic counterpart, and this is mostly expected for binary black holes, but also for some neutral star black holes. Uh, in this case, what we do is basically a cross-correlation between the uh, distribution of galaxies, uh, which you see here in this color map, and the uh, sky map, so the localization that it's, it's actually a 3D localization that we get from the gravitational wave event. Uh, and in this case, we talk about the dark standard style method or the statistical standard style method. And we, we call it statistical because really what we do is take into account all of the potential host galaxies within a statistical framework. Uh, so let's start from the first type of standard siren. What, where do we currently stand? So, uh, so far we had uh, one and, and probably last uh, gravitational wave event with an electromagnetic counterpart, and this was GW170817. Uh, this is a, an image from our DCAM observations back in 2017. So this event was used to make the first measurement of the ca uh, Hubble constant as a standard siren. Uh, the measurement, uh, the final measurement is shown here, and the posterior distribution on H0 is shown here in this plot in blue. Uh, of course, as you can see it, here, you see the, the one and two sigma regions uh, compared to the constraints from Planck and the and shoes of, from, from supernovae and from CMB. Uh, so if you see these color uh, field regions are much smaller than even the one sigma uncertainty that you have from just one event. But of course, this is just one event. So we expect that as we increase the statistics, this probe will become uh, also competitive with the current CMB and type 1A uh, measurements. Um, and what I will want to mention about this probe is that it's really ideal to solve the Hubble constant tension. And the reason for, for that is, first of all, that it's self-calibrating. So it's independent of the distance ladder. So as I mentioned earlier, this is what we really want to try and understand whether uh, the uh, tension is arising from systematics or new physics. And it's also cosmological model independent because uh, while this constraint from Planck is really bound to a flat lambda CDM scenario, uh, in this case, this event is just uh, 40 megaparsecs and we don't really, we're not really sensitive to other cosmological parameters, but just to the uh, Hubble expansion. Um, the limitations that I'll mention about this method are uh, mostly the, the peculiar velocity in this case, which was a very important uh, component, because, especially because this event was so nearby, we expect this to become less important as we go to higher redshifts. Um, and also the other thing is the uh, inclination angle. Uh, so this is really degenerate with the luminosity distance measurement. Uh, so this translates into, into the degeneracy between the inclination angle here on the y-axis and the Hubble constant. So most of the uncertainty on the Hubble constant from this one event really comes from the inclination angle. And 
this degeneracy between the distance and the angle can actually be broken if one has some external constraints, for example, uh, from electromagnetic observations of the counterpart. Uh, one is, if one is able to, to say something in that case about the view, so-called viewing angle, then you can improve your h naught constraint. Um, Okay, so now let me move on to the second part, the second case, which is the dark thunder siren case. Um, you might wonder why we want to do a measurement of this kind um, and not just wait for, for more, for higher statistics for the bright thunder siren case, which is definitely much easier and much easier measurements to make. Um, well, uh, the first answer that I'll give you is that we have many, many more binary black hole events that do not have a counterpart. And actually, we also have uh, binary interstars and possibly neutral star black hole events that do not have a counterpart. So, so far, we only have one event with counterpart and all of the others are just sitting on top of our galaxy catalogs. So it just makes sense to try and attempt to make this measurement, which will become, as you see, uh, very constraining in the future. Um, so first, I'm showing you this slide to, to um, maybe let you better grasp how this measurement works. So here I'm showing you uh, simulated events on top of uh, some DES-like galaxy simulations. So here we simulated gravitational wave events uh, on top of galaxies by assuming that H0 was 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. And as you can see, here, this uh, single, this, this um, gray lines are uh, single event posteriors, and some of them are highlighted in color so that you see them better. Um, as you can see, just this uh, one event posteriors have, each of them has several peaks, and that's totally expected because the peaks correspond to the large scale structure along the line of sight. So if you only had one galaxy, you would expect just one peak, uh, but as you have multiple galaxies, then you will have multiple peaks also in the H0 distribution. Uh, but the important thing is that after you combine enough of these events, you're able to recover the input value of the Hubble constant and, the, um, uh, and this combination of events is shown by the black solid line. Um, what happens when the distance uncertainty or the redshift uncertainty is increased is what you see going from the top panel to the middle panel. So here the distance uncertainty is increased and from the middle to the bottom panel here, the uh, uncertainty on the redshift is increased. So you see that the, these peaks become broader and broader as increases uncertainties. And so this is what we will expect to see and when we make the measurements with the actual, actually real um, gravitational wave events. So one thing that I really wanted to bring home from this slide is that we cannot do precision cosmology from one or even just a few events of, uh, of this type, so without a counterpart. And you can see this if you look at the bottom plot, which is even um, quite optimistic for uh, current uh, uh, level of gravitational wave measurements, where the localization is still um, not as it will be, for example, after uh, LIGO updates to, to A+. Plus. Um, and so you can see here that you have one broad, very broad posterior, maybe with one or two peaks. Uh, the peak might, o might not even be at the right value of H0. But the important thing is that we'll get a very nice measurement after we combine 100, in this case I'm showing you 100 events, um, that's the order of magnitude that we want. Um, so we were able to do this for the first time with GW170814, uh, which was a great event, at least for, for us in, in DS. Uh, the reasons for that being that this was the first binary black hole that was detected by both LIGO and Virgo. So the, um, the localization error was, was much, much smaller than previous events. Uh, we were able to uh, cover more than 90% of the probability with our DCAM gravitational wave follow-up, we did not find any uh, interesting counterparts. So it makes sense to use this event as a dark thunder siren, but especially it falls right in the middle of the DES footprint, which means that we have uh, a great, quite complete galaxy catalog to use for a statistical thunder siren measurement. Uh, so you've already seen this, um, this figure where I'm showing you the distribution uh, and the presence of large scale structure from the DES catalogs uh, in the localization area. But most importantly, uh, what I showed you for, from the previous slides, the important thing is the, the large scale structure along the line of sight. So 
The important thing that we want to look at is the Rashid distribution of galaxies. And so this is what I'm showing you here. Uh, and in particular, I subtracted from this Rashid distribution, uh, a Rashid distribution which is uniform in co-moving volume. Um, so you see, uh, in this way, you can see better the presence of over densities and under densities, which will show up in our final H0 posterior. Um, so this was our result. Um, the posterior distribution in H0 is shown here in, in red. Uh, of course, this is very broad, even broader than the GW17 or H17, but this was totally expected also already from our simulations. Uh, nevertheless, this was a very interesting um, measurements to make because it was the first one uh, that used a binary black hole to make a measurement of the Hubble constant. Sorry, Antonella, can I ask, as you go to higher Z, right, cosmology becomes important. So what assumption are you making on the cosmology? Are you assuming it's from the CDM somewhere or? Yes. No, no, we don't have to worry about it. Yeah, so at the moment I'm assuming lambda CDM, uh, but, and I fixed the other cosmological parameters. Uh, of course, at this level of uncertainty, it doesn't really matter. So we tried to just shift by one or two sigmas, these values, and it really doesn't matter at this, at this okay, level. Okay, so what's very interesting is Holly Cow have a descending feature in H0, like across their lenses. Now, if the model is not flat lambda CDM, if it's some, something else that describes our universe, generically, you would expand some feature in H0. You don't expect it to be a constant. Now, if you're combining H0s across wide redshift ranges, I would worry that you are going to get different values. Yes. I, mean, just, I mean, as Holly Co go, go forward and they analyze more lenses, we will see if there is a descending trend there or something in H0 for flat lambda CDM. It's something that basically I think LIGO should be taking into account, if possible. Yes, yes this is definitely a really good point. So, so my view on this... Uh, is that, well, for the bright standard siren case, I think we don't really have to worry about because our horizon will be at 200 megaparsec, maybe 300 megaparsec uh, in the next probably five or more years. Um, in terms of the dark standard siren case, my view is that we should only focus on the most well-localized events and these well-localized events will always be at the lower, lowest redshift. So I think we should really just limit ourselves to say being below 700 megaparsecs or even less, where it, I think it doesn't really matter if we shift from lambda CTM much. Matter, yeah, you're right. It will always be normal. Yeah, so th that's my view, at least. I, yeah, I don't, I don't want to use high redshift events at this point. Okay. Um, so, uh, okay, so this is history at the moment. Uh, let's move on to, to uh, what's interesting in the present. So uh, the third observing run by LIGO and Virgo uh, just recently finished earlier this year. Um, it lasted almost a year and there were more than 50, 50 public alerts, five of which were followed up by DCAM and in particular, I think three were followed up by our team uh, in DES. Uh, we didn't find any convincing electromagnetic counterparts, at least so far, and I, and I suggest you go and, and look at these papers on GW190814, uh, which I'll discuss soon. Uh, but this, in this paper, we're really looking at the candidate counterparts and, and placing interesting limits on the emission, on the kilonova emission from, from this uh, event. And also this other candidate, uh, Van Angelstar s 19 g uh, we have analyzed this other event in this paper. Um, what matters from, for, from the cosmology point of view is that some of these events are really well localized and some of them also fall in the dark energy survey. So uh, one of them that you see here, uh, mind you, this blue contour is the DES footprint. So here you see GW170814, which is the binary black hole I just told you about. Uh, and then the one that is particularly interesting is GW190814. Now the others that you see here are still gravitational wave candidates, so I don't really want to, to use them for cosmologies quite, quite yet at least. Um, so we'll just focus on these two events. Um, and so these are really the, the, the two best localized events, but in particular GW190814 uh, was the best 
localized event in terms of volume and is second only to GW170817. So the, the event with the counterpart, which was at 40 megaparsec, and so it was really well localized and loud. Um, so this is the reason why it's very interesting for, for a Jackson Arsari measurement, and it also has improved distance and localization uh, from the higher order mold. So it, in the end, this event had an 18 square degrees localization, and it was at 240 megaparsecs. Um, the other reason why this is very interesting is because uh, the LIGO and Virgo collaborations have shown that this event contained uh, was coming from a binary that contained either the lightest black hole ever seen in a binary or the heaviest neutral star ever seen in a binary. So this was a very nice result by the ABC recently. Um, so in our work with the dark energy survey, uh, what we did for the dark sun star measurement was improving the photometric redshift treatment. Uh, in particular, we, we did a specific validation at the lowest, at this lowest redshift here you see that the range that we're interested in goes out to redshift 0 0.14. This is for our very broad uh, uh, prior on H0, but really we're interested in redshift around 0 0.06, uh, which is the redshift of, of the event if we assume an H0 of 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Um, so as you can see from this plot, which is similar to the one I showed you earlier for the binary black hole event, uh, here you should just focus on the blue line, uh, this is coming from um, stacking, basically the full photometric redshift PDFs, and we have shown that this, and, and, and this has been shown also in other, uh, in a lot of other papers, we have shown that the, the, the stacking of the full redshift PDFs rather than using the mean values or, or some Gaussian approximation of the PDFs for, for the individual galaxies, the, the stacking is really working much better uh, in terms of reproducing the, the, the redshift distribution of galaxies, and this is why we decided to use this estimator uh, in, our, in our work, uh, which was different in previous works on our standard science. Uh, we also implemented a photometric redshift bias marginalization, and we recovered this bias as a function of redshift by looking at a spectroscopic sample that uh, covers the DES footprint. Um, so again, as you can see here, uh, there, is some, there are some over densities and under densities, and this will show up in our final posterior uh, on each knot. So our final result from uh, GW190814 and GW170814 is shown here by this uh, blue curve. Again, the, the presence of multiple peaks is totally expected in the, in the dark under siren uh, measurement. Uh, and then finally, we combine this with GW170817, uh, in particular, a reanalysis of that that takes into account uh, a, an improved treatment of the peculiar velocities. Uh, and our final H0 posterior is shown here in red. Um, and our constraint at one sigma is 72 plus 12 minus 8.2 kilometers per second per megaparsec. So with this, um, with this work, we really showed that even just a few events uh, can provide some substantial improvement to the bright standard siren uh, measurement of standard sirens, uh, oh sorry, of the Hubble constant. And this is the case really if these events are, are enough well localized. Um, if we imagine to combine all of the events that we already have um, uh, from some simulations, we, we can prove that you can reach up to a 30% a improvement to the current measurements um, from standard sirens. But I think that the very interesting constraints will come in the future when LIGO and Virgo run a design sensitivity. So uh, what I'm showing you here is a uh, single event posteriors here in color and a combined posterior in black uh, on each knot on a simulation of about 200 detections that go up to 900 megaparsecs. And this simulation show that we can reach a two to 5% statistical precision. Uh, so we'll deal with the systematic later, um, at least with a DES-like galaxy catalog. So this show us, shows us really how important it will be to have some nice and complete galaxy catalogs that we can use uh, in the future when LIGO and Virgo will give us even more well-localized events and we can combine hundred, hundreds of those. Um, now let me move on to uh, the near future, so the dark energy spectroscopic instruments and, and what we can do 
in terms of gravitational wave cosmology with DESI. So DESI is a 5,000 fiber spectrograph that is currently mounted at the Kitt Peak Mile 4 meter telescope in Arizona. Uh, it has a, a, an eight square degrees field of view, which is very nice, as we mentioned earlier, for, for gravitational wave follow-up. Um, this experiment is really thought of as a stage four BAO and redshift phase distortion dark energy experiment. Um, it will cover about 4,000 square degrees of the northern hemisphere, so really almost everything extra of the extragalactic sky that we can think of. Uh, so we'll be taking redshift for more than 30 million galaxies. And uh, we have already started taking data earlier this year. We had to interrupt because of COVID, uh, but we are, we're hoping to start again with science verification later this year. And so starting uh, probably uh, the first year um, next uh, in 2021 or so. Um, so DESI will observe very different types of galaxies uh, that go uh, actually from, from quasars at high redshifts, emission line galaxies and, and luminous red galaxies. But I think the most interesting sample of galaxies for um, at least for, for gravitational waves will be uh, this low redshift BGS survey, the bright galaxy sample. Uh, so this is a magnitude limited survey that will look at more or less 10 million galaxies in the in the near universe and it's really magnitude limited to to our band of 19.5 actually has a uh, a faint part of the survey that will go down to 20 and will uh, basically go uh, and observe galaxies out to redshift point four or so so really the the low redshift um, uh, survey that we need for gravitational wave both follow-ups and uh, cosmology um, so I think that it will be very interesting to see how we can work together with the wide field photometric surveys uh, and uh, wide field spectroscopic surveys like DESI for gravitational wave follow-up. So one of the things that we realized during the, the last uh, observing run from LIGO and Virgo uh, was that even for this well localized, quite well localized events, say below uh, 200 square degrees, we would still find hundreds of potential candidates that are really hard to classify just from photometry and maybe one or two epochs. Um, so it would really be great, a great addition to have uh, some multi-object spectroscopy that can go and quickly classify uh, all of these transients that are found with, uh, with imaging and at the same time take the redshift of the potential host galaxies to tell us whether these are compatible with the 3D localization that we get from the gravitational wave events. Uh, so hopefully that's something that Jesse will be able to do uh, in the near future, maybe even uh, during the next uh, LIGO Virgo Kagra observing run. Uh, so this is just a, a movie to show you a simulation that we made uh, for possible observation of this event uh, from, from February. Uh, so this is an adaptation of the code that we have from, from DES that tells us what are, wh where should we go observe uh, on a night um, for a particular event to maximize our chances of finding the counterparts. So then the second way of um, helping uh, the gravitational wave follow up, even if we don't look for the actual transient uh, is as I mentioned earlier, just look at the potential host galaxies from, from the BGS uh, and also help us measuring the peculiar velocities that so far I have talked about as uh, a systematic or, or as a, an extra uncertainty on the Hubble constant measurement. But we'll see later how these are also interesting to make cosmological measurements. Um, and uh, the interesting thing about uh, Wright's under sirens are, is that in the future, this will really help us constrain uh, H0 and hopefully solve the, or understand better the Hubble constant tension because the expectation, as you can see from this plot, is that the uncertainty of the Hubble constant um, will reach about a 2% when we have about 50 events with their electromagnetic counterpart. Uh, and this is um, regardless of the distance reach, uh, the, sorry, regardless of the peculiar velocity uncertainty, which is really shown in this plot as this band. So, um, you know, this, the, the higher values will be given 
if we are having, I think in this case, was a 400 kilometers per second uncertainty on the peculiar velocities and the lower value would be 100 kilometers per second uncertainty. Um, so if we can measure well uh, the peculiar velocities, uh, regardless of the distance reach, we will reach this 2% uncertainty after 50 events. Um, and so this is what this, this plot is showing. And of course, the, the bright galaxy sample will also be a natural sample for dark standard siren measurements, not only to find the, the hosts of the events that have a counterpart and make a bright standard siren measurement. So now let me move on uh, to the way we can measure peculiar velocities with uh, gravitational waves. So let me remind you um, what peculiar velocities are. So when we refer to galaxies, peculiar velocities, we really refer to the motions of galaxies on top of the Hubble expansion. Um, they tend to follow the uh, inhomogeneous clustering of large scale structure and also the laws of gravity. So these are also interesting to actually measure cosmological parameters. So if we're able to measure the peculiar velocity field, then we can measure the growth of large scale structure and even probe gravity. Um, one way of measuring the peculiar velocity field is to look at galaxies that have a distance measurement. So historically, this has been done with fundamental plane galaxies, for example, and more recently with supernovae type 1As. Uh, and here we suggest that we can use also gravitational wave uh, events since they carry also a distance measurement. Um, so uh, what we use in, in the work that I'll, I'll tell you about later is the peculiar velocity power spectrum, the over density power spectrum and their cross correlation. And all of these power spectra depend on this um, uh, uh, FD uh, that you see here. So this is really uh, the product of the growth rate with the linear growth factor. So we are really probing this or equivalently the F sigma eight um, product. And in turn, this product is sensitive to the growth index gamma, uh, which depends on gravity. So this is how, by measuring the peculiar velocity uh, field, we are sensitive both to, to, to this product here and to gravity. Um, so the first question that we asked when we started this work was, um, what type of gravitational wave sources could, if at all, give competitive constraints with other um, distance indicator or other uh, probes of the growth of structure and of gamma. So the first comparison we made was with supernova type one a So we know what the typical uh, dispersion, at least in, in magnitude dispersion, would be for type one a's and what their rate is. Um, so we needed to find something that was similar, either in terms of or rate or, or maybe something better in terms of uh, typical uncertainty on the distance. Uh, we know that binary neutral star events are about an order of magnitude lower in terms of rate compared to the type 1As. Um, but at the same time, if we have a gravitational wave experiment, this will be sensitive to 4 pi of the sky, uh, more or less, to first order at least. While if we have a supernovae type 1A survey, this will probably cover maybe half of the sky. Um, at the same time, uh, with third generation gravitational wave detectors, so we're really thinking in the 2030s here, um, Einstein Telescope, Cosmic Explorer, will be, will be providing very precise distance uncertainties that go down to a few percent, at least in the local universe, which is what we are interested in. Uh, and of course, to, in order to, to uh, probe the peculiar velocity field, we really need an electromagnetic emission, so we need to identify a unique host galaxy uh, in this case. Um, there's other possibilities, neutral star black holes or really well localized events would contribute to this measurement, but here we just focus on binary neutral star events from third generation gravitational wave detectors. Um, so here, uh, what we do first is fixing that gamma parameter that we saw earlier, fixing it to the uh, GR value and uh, trying to constrain, well, get, a, get at least a, a, a forecast on the constraints that we expect on F sigma eight. Uh, we do this in, as a function of redshift in three redshift beams uh, out to redshift 0 0.3. Um, the expected constraint from uh, one Einstein telescope, uh, so just one detector, the hope is that we'll have uh, maybe more than one, maybe an Einstein telescope and one cosmic explorer, so one in Europe and one in the US, uh, or maybe even more, that would be great. Um, 
And the expectation is given here by these blue triangles. Sorry if it's a little bit hard to see, uh, but um, the expectation is that we'll reach about a 3% precision when we use these 3G gravitational wave events plus the over density power spectrum that comes from uh, upcoming galaxy surveys. So we're thinking about something that could cover the whole sky, just like the uh, gravitational wave events. Uh, actually, we're here we're assuming a bit less of the, of the sky, uh, but really something in the north and in the south. So here we're thinking about DESI and Typhon. So the constraints from this type of measurement are shown here by these blue triangles. And if you compare them with the expectation from a similar type of survey from supernovae type 1a though, uh, plus, again, uh, like your, uh, sorry, the um, over density power spectrum from Taipan and DASI, uh, then we get these orange uh, triangles here. So, as you can see, the gravitational waves are actually um, competitive with the future supernovae type 1a uh, surveys that can constrain F sigma 8. Um, and uh, the other thing I will mention is that these lines here are showing you. Uh, again, the case of GR for gamma of 0 0.55 is here by the, shown here by this purple, uh, darker purple line. And these other two lines show different values of gamma that are corresponding to other DGP uh, theories and F of R theories. So if you look at this diagram, you can see that if you're able to constrain F sigma 8 well enough, then we can also discern between different values of gamma. So the next thing we do is we, we let gamma vary instead of fixing it. Um, and, uh, and these are our expectation on the precision on gamma. So the colors are shown, the, the, the scale is shown here. Uh, this is giving you the, the, uh, the expected precision on gamma. And here you have on the x-axis the density of events uh, integrated over time. And on the y-axis you have the distance uncertainty uh, that we get from the gravitational wave um, measurement. Um, and so as you can see, what we really want to do is be below the 0 0.04 line, uh, which will give us more or less a three sigma uh, discrepancy between the different, um, the different, the three different models, gravity models that I mentioned earlier. So we really want to be in this corner here of this plot. The expectation for, again, one Einstein telescope detector is to be around here, so just below the 0 0.04 line. Uh, and then for two or three detectors, 3G detectors will live close to here in these boxes. So we'll probably go down to 0 0.03 uh, in uncertainty. And of course, there is a lot of uncertainty on the um, uh, expected rate for, for binary neutral stars. So at the moment, we could really shift from this side of the plot to this side of the plot. Uh, of course, if the rate is lower, what we need to do is just wait longer. So the results shown here is really for, for a five-year uh, gravitational wave experiment. Um, now here on the right, uh, the y-axis is the same. Um, I, I should have mentioned that this distance uncertainty really scales uh, with, uh, with distance, so it gets worse and worse with distance. Uh, but the value that you see here is at redshift 0 0.1. Um, so on the x-axis here, uh, I'm plotting the maximum redshift that we'll be able to reach. So we go out to redshift 0 0.3 as we did in the, in the previous F sigma 8 measurement. Uh, but as you can see, as we go beyond redshift 0 0.2, um, you know, for a few percent uncertainty on the distance, which is the expectation for this type of, uh, for at least two uh, 3G detectors, then we'll leave in this air region here and going from 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 doesn't really change that much to our constraints. So we can relax it and say that even if we just see counterparts of Tereshi 0 0.2, we'll still be able to make an interesting constraint on gamma. Uh, and then of course, if we add, galaxy over densities as we did before on F sigma 8, this, uh, this constraint improves uh, and this is how it gets and then it can go down to 0 0.02 and 0 0.03 uncertainty on, on gamma on the, on the growth index. So now I'm at the last part of my talk uh, and I will tell you about using galaxies to probe the origin of, of binaries. 
Um, so the reason why this is interesting is because both for binary neutral stars and binary black holes and even near star black holes, their origin is still unclear. Uh, in terms of binary neutral star, the more standard scenario is that these uh, binaries form as isolated binaries. So through some episode of star formation, they, mm, you have this binary made of two massive stars and at some point, um, the more massive one will undergo supernova and become a neutral star. This will be followed by some very uncertain common envelope phase. And finally, the other star will also undergo supernova. And then if the binary managed to, to survive the two supernova explosion and stay bound uh, in a binary that will merge within hopefully less than a Hubble time, that's, that's what we expect to see in gravitational waves. Um, and then the scenario that we suggest from observations of GW170817 is that uh, takes, takes into account the fact that dynamical interactions could perhaps help uh, the formation or the merging of uh, binaries in uh, dense stellar environment. And in terms of binary black holes, so again, isolated binaries is one way of forming them. Uh, dynamical interactions is probably even a more um, you know, famous scenario for binary black holes. Uh, then more recently, primordial black holes have been suggested as a possible um, black hole uh, formation channel for this uh, LIGO Virgo observed uh, quite massive stellar black holes. Um, and then another channel is uh, the formation or, or the assisted in spiral of black holes within AGN disks. And there was actually one um, possible counterpart that was reported recently. Um, but okay, in any case, for, for all of these uh, binaries, the origin is still unclear. And the hope is that by looking at the host galaxies, uh, we can actually say something about the environment and the star formation history, and so say something about the way the binary was formed. So we did this for uh, the one and only uh, event for which we know the host galaxy, that, and that was GW170817. Uh, so this was found to be an NGC 4993, uh, a quite uh, massive and old uh, galaxies in, in which we found the presence of weak ionized gas emission lines. And we found those to be due to the presence of a weak AGN in the center of this galaxy uh, and not by the presence of star formation. So we really did not find any evidence for star formation the, by looking at the, the, the um, spectroscopic data and by looking at the uh, photometric data of this galaxy. And this was quite surprising for a binary that is thought to be formed through the isolated binary scenario, so through star formation. Uh, so we computed um, the expected rate of uh, binary neutral star mergers in galaxies like NGC 4993, and we can do that uh, by assuming that the fraction of the neutral stars will be uh, in binaries, and we get this fraction from constraints, typical constraints that come from uh, simulations and, and Milky Way constraints. Uh, and then we relate to this to the, the rate of formation of neutral stars, and this will be, of course, measured at a different time uh, with respect to the, the, the merging time. And the difference between these two times is what we call the time delay. So the, the time between the formation of the binary and the merging of the binary. Um, the neutral star formation rate can of course be computed uh, by looking at the, some initial mass function, some star formation history, and then some stealth function that tells us which mass range of stars end up being uh, uh, neutral stars. So uh, by making uh, all of these assumptions, we can compute uh, the rate of neutral star mergers expected in early and late type galaxies. And what we find is that the rate expected in early type galaxies like NGC 4993 is about an order of magnitude lower than what we would find in late type galaxies or more star forming galaxies. Um, so the expected number of binary neutral stars from nearby uh, galaxies like NGC 4993 was about 0 0.04. So we concluded that observing a merger from an isolated binary in this type of galaxy was quite unlikely. And we went and looked a bit more in detail about the history of NGC 4993. Uh, so this is a, um, a nice image, a nice quad decam image of, of this host galaxy. Uh, and here on the right, you see uh, a residual image from GCOM from which we subtracted the 
uh, best fit light profile for this galaxy. And the same for uh, a bit zoomed in from the uh, Hubble Space Telescope uh, image. So as you can see from these residuals, uh, there is a presence of uh, several shells. And also from HSC, you can see the presence of dust lanes. And all of these are really signs of a recent galaxy merger. Uh, in fact, the shells, uh, shell galaxies are thought to be just arcs of enhanced surface brightness that correspond to the infalling material from a, secondary, uh, from a secondary galaxy that merged with a more massive one. And these are really the relics of a galaxy merger. Um, so if you look at the right here, this is the material from the, the secondary galaxy. And you can see how these form shells that you see expanding and at some point they will disappear. So by looking at the distribution of the shells, we can actually uh, try to constrain the time at which the galaxy merger happened. So we computed the survival time of the innermost shell, uh, which is of the order of about 200 million years. And so that tells us that the merger happened, the galaxy merger happened about 200 million years before the binary initial star coalescence. So I told you how it, it's unlikely that the binary formed as an isolated binary. I told you how the position of the transient lies on a shell, which is a relic of a galaxy merger. And this I haven't showed you, uh, but we think that the galaxy merging activity might um, relate uh, the host of short GRB. And we compare to other, to a, to a larger sample of short GRB hosts. And 170817 was also uh, seen to be um, associated with the short GRB. So from all of this, we concluded that it's possible that galaxy mergers can perhaps boost or, uh, or help the binary interstar formation or, or, or merging just by boosting dynamic, dynamical interactions. And um, of course, just from just one event, it's hard to, to draw any conclusion. We'll need about 10 to, to draw uh, conclusions. Um, but it's interesting to see that there, was, there were signs of a recent galaxy merger in a galaxy where a binary initial star merger was otherwise quite improbable. Um, so I'll quickly mention that uh, we recently used this, uh, the environment of GW170817 to try and understand how probable it is that this was actually a neutral star primordial black hole merger. Um, so the fact that GW170817 was a neutral star black hole cannot be ruled out. Of course, we see we saw a counterpart, which means that it's more likely that we have actually a neutral star, at least in one of the two components, but we cannot rule out the fact that the other component could be a black hole. So maybe uh, a primordial black hole that was in the mass range of uh, typical neutral stars. Um, so I don't, I think I'm almost out of time, so I don't want to go too much into detail. What we find is that it's, it's quite improbable that we, this was a neutral star PBH merger, uh, but it was still an interesting scenario to, to look into. Uh, the more relevant uh, channel that I want to mention is another formation channel for binary black holes. So after GW170817, we asked the question whether also binary black holes could be related somehow to galaxy merger. So what we suggested in this paper that was published earlier this year um, is whether the, the black holes that are being detected by LIGO and Virgo could be the massive, some massive central, uh, well, actually this would, wouldn't be massive, massive stellar black holes, that would be uh, the central black holes of uh, very low mass galaxies. So what we do is just extrapolate it, extrapolating the relation that we see existing between the central black hole mass and the stellar mass of the host galaxy. This has been studied, I think, down to uh, stellar masses of 10 to the 8. Uh, we extrapolate it down to the values of the LIGO and Virgo black holes, and we find that uh, the host galaxies would be in the mass range of about 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 solar masses. So quite low mass dwarf galaxies that have been uh, nevertheless observed in the, in the local universe. Um, and we asked the question whether the merging between these um, dwarf galaxies is ever high enough uh, so that we can reproduce the observed rate of binary black holes from LIGO and Virgo. And the answer of that is yes, uh, we can reproduce it if we go down to very high redshifts. So here, see, just making different assumptions about the uh, number density of these galaxies, uh, which is quite unknown. Uh, we get these two different lines. 
Um, but if you, if you look at Redshift, Redshift 1.5 to Redshift 3 or so, you see that you can reproduce this range of um, rates that are expected from LEGO world observations and the ranges between these two red lines. So if we want to extrapolate this to the redshift of the observed um, binary black holes, this would imply a five to seven giga year time delay between the, the merging of the galaxies and the merging of the central black holes. And I think this is very relevant for GW1905-21, uh, which was a very recent announcement by the LIGO and Virgo collaboration. And this was very interesting, very exciting, because um, for the first time, the component masses, both of the component masses from the binary black hole ended in this so-called mass gap, where we don't really expect to see black holes through cellular evolution. Um, and this was really also interesting, because the final remnant black hole mass uh, was the first intermediate mass black hole observed, uh, or confirmed at least. Um, so we could try to explain this particular event, uh, this particular event uh, with the formation channel that I just mentioned. And so if you look at this um, masses from GW190521, you see that by looking at the uh, central black hole to stellar mass relation, we would end up between uh, 10 to the 5.5 and 10 to the 6 solar masses. Uh, that would be the expected mass of the uh, host galaxy. Um, and uh, um, again, the observed rate could be explained by the merging uh, of dwarf galaxies. And in this case, we find a time delay that is uh, roughly below 5 giga years. And we show that with dynamical friction, we can actually explain uh, this, this time scale. So, uh, this paper will appear on the archive in the next few days, uh, so I hope you'll be interested in, in looking into this. So to conclude, uh, uh, synergies between gravitational wave experiments and, and photometric and spectroscopic surveys can really bring us a lot of interesting new research. In particular, uh, we can uh, hopefully find new counterparts, uh, make standard measurements of the Hubble constant in the future, of dark energy parameters. We can also measure the pure velocity field and constrain uh, F sigma 8 or even uh, the growth rate gamma. And we can also explore the origin of binaries. Uh, and this is also true uh, if we don't find counterparts. So we can again make dark standard size measurement that will become very interesting as uh, Lago and Virgo run at the science sensitivity and as more detectors join the network. And also we can think about studying cross correlations of binary black holes with um, galaxy surveys to probe the nature of massive stellar black holes measured with bias and try to understand whether they could be a, a fraction of the dark matter or not. Um, so I, I'll leave it here um, and I'll take some questions, but for people who are not connected at the moment, you should feel free to, to send me emails or contact me on Slack if you are on any of these collaborations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hey, we're now open for questions. Any questions or comments? Hello, Antonella. This is Arman. Uh, thanks for the very good talk. Um, I just, you know, as you know, I want to emphasize again on the importance of the cosmology when we cross the redshift of 0 0.08 or so. I think for the um, this DESI like uh, or DES like catalog, which you uh, mentioned about 200 events. I, I think you mentioned that you go as deep as 900 megaparsec, uh, which would be about redshift of 0.2 around that. So I think um, then I think considering the background cosmology would be very important uh, to have an unbiased and uh, well precise measurement of the Hubble constant. Uh, of course, you know, one can use the survey one is using itself because that practically let's say desi or uh, there's you know they would have their own constraint on cosmology which can be used um, to have a good estimation of the background cosmology and since you're not going too far in the redshift um, that would be good enough but uh, but yeah i mean i just want to emphasize as we had in these papers with ryan Keely and eric lind there are two papers that uh, going beyond redshift of 0 0.08 or so um, it's important to have a knowledge of the background cosmology. Yeah, that's, that's definitely true. Um, and I think it will be interesting as, you know, we have 
larger statistics to actually try and measure it even just from standard silence. Um, we'll we'll right. talk better about the rates, I guess, soon uh, from Lago and Virgo, but um, you know, if we have enough statistics, it will be interesting to start to actually measure that. Right. Actually, I may write you an email maybe sometime soon to, to see the forecast of the thing. Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah. Do. Hello? Yes. Yeah, sorry. So thanks for the talk. Uh, I have a bit of a naive question. So when you, when you calculate the, uh, the, the dark standard sirens, uh, do you assume every galaxy in your sample has uh, an equal probability of uh, hosting the event? Yes, at the moment, that's, that's what I'm doing. Um, just because I don't, I don't think we have a good reason to say that binary black holes should happen in particular types of galaxies. I know that other works have uh, weighted the galaxies based on uh, the K-band or B-band luminosity, which are in turn uh, telling you something about the star formation rate or the stellar mass of the galaxy. But I, d I don't think we know enough about these black holes to say that it should happen in a star forming galaxy or, or not. Um, so I'm hoping that mm, uh, from the population analysis of these black holes um, from O3, we'll learn something about the properties and maybe we can say something about the origin of these black holes. Um, so okay. if, yeah, if they're, for yeah. example, similar, uh, similar origin, then maybe uh, depending on the time delay, we can say whether it's supposed to be a higher mass, uh, higher stellar mass stars or more star forming uh, galaxies that we should wait more. Okay. Are we screaming at me mass of galaxies? Sorry, what? It seems a little naive at the moment, right? If you're not even correcting for mass or taking mass into account or like simple things. I mean, like if you look at type one super a, type one a, there's all sorts of corrections for various things. And one of them is the, the mass of the host, right? So, I mean, this seems like a very preliminary calculation. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, um, lots of factors appear as you go on, right? Yeah. And you also assume that you've actually measured the host, which sounds like sounds like a really stupid comment, but obviously there's completion issues and. You know, you're not measuring all the galaxies, so. but you have to do that, I suppose. Yes. Um, so one can correct for incompleteness of the galaxy catalogs. That's uh, that's for sure. Um, although at the end of the day, that the you know the the strength of this measurement is really that there is large scale structure. So unless these events happen in, I don't know. Uh, very isolated galaxies all the time, uh, then, you know, even if we're not complete down to the lowest masses, we know that even dwarf galaxies are clustered and, and with larger mass galaxies. And so we hope that, you know, the, the measurement should work as long as the large scale structure is followed by the host galaxies. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions or comments? Hi, uh, thanks for your talk. That was really interesting. I was wondering if, um, if you understand why the posteriors on H naught are so non Gaussian. Yes, uh, so that really comes from the large scale structure. Um, I, you know, we, if the DNTZ doesn't have um, Gaussian distributions, it, then this will be reflected in the posterior, although it's more complicated than that because that, uh, there's a convolution between the uh, likelihood that comes from uh, the galaxies and the likelihood that comes from the gravitational wave observations. Um, so th there is no reason for which it, it should be Gaussian. Uh, it depends on the, the redshift distribution of the galaxies. Okay. And can you go back to your uh, f sigma eight plot? Sure. Okay, so when you are in non like non GR models, um, you start to have uh, you know 
uh, scale dependent growth basically. Um, and I'm wondering because of the, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm wondering what uh, scale uh, GE wave can probe. What are the scales that we can probe and if we can do some, you know, multi-scale uh, study of the growth? Um, so at the moment, we're restricting ourselves to scales that go down more or less to the class, galaxy cluster scale. Uh, so we don't really go below that. Um, yeah, I think going below that could help our constraints. But I, yeah, I think we're, at the moment, we're not at the level of modeling that. But it will be very interesting in the future. That's at least from, yeah, for this forecast on from the supernovae and the uh, GW events. Okay, thank you. Sorry, Anthony, yeah, sorry, can I ask a question? Yeah, no worries, yeah. I, I didn't see any way to properly raise my hand and all that. My name is uh, Maurice. And uh, my question is uh, on systematics. When you start observing many, many, hopefully, uh, binary coalescences of the kind that is of interest to this, so preferably uh, new star, new star coalescence, but they may ultimately also come in some variety. Thus far, the assumption on the analysis has always been ellipticity, orbital ellipticity is zero. But conceivably, when you start detecting many of these, that uh, is not something that's tenable to, to assume for all of them. And of course, uh, if the true ellipticity is non-zero, then you're making a systematic uh, error in your equivalently effective chirp mass because f of e uh, is a function of e squared. So it doesn't average out. You know, there's no such thing as negative ell 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 ellipticity. And so you're going to introduce uh, a systematic bias in your results if indeed the true, say, standard deviation in the ellipticity is ultimately non-zero. And measuring ellipticity from gravitational wave observation, as you know, is very difficult. So how do you plan to account for this uh, potentially systematic uncertainty? Yeah, um, well, I don't think I've ever thought about the ellipticity. I'm not sure how much. Um, I don't really have a, a guess for how much that would bias your result. Uh, my, my simple guess is that if, if it's a bias, uh, we can probably compute that and, and correct for it. Uh, but I, I don't really have a guess of uh, how much that bias would be. Um, I don't know if you have any idea, if you, if you looked into this. Well, I looked into this in the sense of uh, trying to make sense out of 1908-14. Uh, I mean, we all try to make sense out of it. And uh, yes, you can account for the relatively short duration burst as you see it observationally in the gravitational wave data by a large mass ratio. But you can also think of it as the result of an enhanced ellipticity, well, by scenario that may be much less likely and all that, but just mathematically, if you were to pursue a fit to the relatively short, like roughly two seconds or so observed chirp, that can also come from a relatively modest uh, ratio mass one to mass two, but with a you know, larger ellipticity. So there is a, a degeneracy in interpreting uh, your gravitational wave chirp. So again, this, you know, you may not have to worry about maybe for one or two events, but if you're going to do this kind of fancy statistics, which ultimately has to be competitive with the other groups, and it's really going to be pushing things to a limit. And I think you have to start worrying about this degeneracy. Okay, yes, that's a, that's a really good point. I think, uh, I, I think I'll definitely look into what the impact of that would be on the luminosity distance. 
That would be definitely interesting. Yeah, and that's of course ultimately where it shows up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, can I broaden this discussion then? Because like Antonella, you sort of glossed over systematics. You mentioned statistical uncertainties, right? And Maurice is now getting to this. What other systematics do you expect? And really, can you, I mean, how much of a grasp can you have on these things? Um, okay, so the number one systematics uh, is really coming from, I think, photometric redshifts. Um, so that, that, from my estimates, it will start to be important as we go down to a 10% uncertainty on H naught from, from dark standard sirens. At least if we're talking about dark standard sirens, um, that will be definitely be number one. Um, and then one thing that we are currently exploring at the moment is the importance of the completeness of the galaxy catalog. So if we can just leave with uh, a galaxy catalog that is providing us very, very precise redshifts, so hopefully a, a spectroscopic redshift catalog, uh, but it's um, somewhat incomplete. Um, but I think the answer to this uh, will really come from the type of um, host galaxies that uh, are hosting this type of events. Um, so I think I will have a better answer for that uh, probably next year after we analyzed uh, all the results from from Leidenberg or uh, from the last observing run. Um, so yeah, so that's in term uh, in terms of um, the dark standard siren case, um, and then in terms of the bright standard siren case, um, I think that as we will go out to larger redshifts, of course, the peculiar velocities will become less important, uh, and if I think one of the main systematics will probably be coming from um, when we try to constrain better the viewing angle from electromagnetic observations, because these are really model dependent um, and that will provide substantial systematics. Um, and as we go forward, I think one thing that it's really interesting is deviation of the luminosity distance from the deviations from, from GR. Um, and that, that becomes more important as you go to higher rest shifts. Uh, so as we plan on, on making constraints on, on dark energy from, from 3G, I think that will be something very interesting to explore. Maurice likes this question. Can I ask you it? Um, Maurice, you're still there. Uh, yeah, I'm listening. Uh, so I think your question is basically whether or not you're going to, you expect gravity, oh, from gravitational waves, whether or not we're going to get a Planck type value for H0 or basically a, a Reese type value for H0. Do you have any inkling of this? So it's, it's curious that basically in earlier publications, the central value is 67. So in the publication that you mentioned earlier, it was now 72, right? It seems like things are going over and back. Yeah, well, at the current level of uncertainty, really consistent with everything. <laughs> um, so this, this is not, not surprising. Um, do you have a feeling for which way it's going to go? Either if there is H0 tension, um, over 70, or do you expect to get Planck? My guess, um, or my hope, <laughs> well, my guess is uh, it's going to be closer to Planck. Oh, that's interesting. Then you're going to be competing with the answer that uh, uh, Adam Rees was giving uh, one of our previous speakers. Yeah. So you should go, you should go for a bet with him. <laughs> I'm not sure I want to do that. <laughs> so, so this is this early universe and late universe uh, division in H0, right? So we always think of, I guess, the gravitational wave um, sources should be relatively uh, late, right? So we would expect a slightly higher H0. If, yeah, if it's new physics, Otherwise, maybe we find that we're consistent only with the CMB and uh, it's matter. Thank you. Any more questions or comments? Now that we have Antonella on record on H0, right? <laughs> Which is good. <laughs> There's no more questions or comments, and then we, we can thank you again for a very interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you.